Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the gallery, and thank you for attending this evening. Uh, just want to remind everyone where the location of the emergency exits are, and uh, that we are uh, recording the proceedings on video. Uh, it hasn't been uh, determined if we can broadcast it, but we do have the records. Uh, so, we remind uh, members of council that disclosure of pecuniary interest could be made now or at any time throughout the meeting. And if required, we will uh, try to break at 8.30 for uh, a brief uh, period of time. So, uh, moving on with the agenda, we have the approval of the agenda. Uh, we have a, a motion that council approves the agenda of session 19-2019 as circulated, moved by Martin and seconded by Mankalo. Is there any additions, deletions? Seeing none, all in favor? That carries. And then on to approval of the previous minutes from session 18-2019 as circulated. Could I have a mover, Gilman and Nix? And was there any issues or concerns about circulation? Seeing none, all in favor? Hello, all in favor? Thank you. <laughs> we are paying attention. I know everybody's thinking about turkey and pumpkin. Okay, uh, now we're on to public question period. If there's any questions from the members of the gallery, please come forward, state your name and address, and pose your question. No, no, you're a delegation. That's it. So seeing none then, we will carry on. We have the delegation scheduled for 715 with John Goodrich uh, regarding the third line uh, road concerns. And uh, we probably should wait till that period of time just to make sure that everybody who's have an interest in this. So we'll carry on with unfinished business. Uh, the response to delegation regarding reducing the speed limit on the seventh line uh, EHS and we have the report from Mr. Dunmore regarding this uh, delegation. Mr. Dunmore, did you want to give us any further information or comments? Um, unless council had further questions, uh, I provided some recommendations subject to your approval, of course. Okay, Councilor. I just want to say good, good report, very good report. And uh, any further comments or? I'm struggling to get my computer working. Um, if you could bear with me for a moment, I'll go on to the public site and uh, yeah, okay. I just went ahead with the report and I have looked at it, but not as carefully. So your recommendations basically uh, are that we, so. Well, the average daily traffic for the three days, while it may not depict what happens 365 days a year, we definitely found we did Friday, sorry, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Um, the traffic counts actually came out lower than what our estimated would be. We did have a couple of uh, drivers that insisted on driving uh, faster than uh, the 80 kilometer unposted, but we also had drivers that were driving 30 to 40 kilometers under the uh, posted speed limit. So um, with the limited number of vehicles, that's where I'm coming to my uh, recommendation to council. Any, any thought of putting a, a portable uh speed measuring sign up there to remind people of what speed they are traveling? Um, yeah, so we're starting to generate a list. So I, right now they've gone, they've been moved from French Drive. Um, didn't get any response back from the residents there, but I did see a lot of brake lights on the days we were down there. <laughs> um, we have one on the hill coming south on first line now at French, and I moved it to the uh, here Ontario north of Bonifesta just before the uh, um, CBC Island Lake uh, entrance. So we put it there for a while. Um, depending on how the delegation goes with third line tonight, um, I had a thought of moving it there and the next one can move. My, my soft concern of the country and lack of people being around that piece of equipment uh, may warrant potential for uh, theft. But uh, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't stop us from putting it up, trying to get a little higher and make it uh, and getting it close to a residential driveway. Hopefully that's a full time resident on that road. 
what we've done on Hockley Road is is to put it in front of, of a, a a house where the uh, the occupants, uh, the former mayor, mm -hmm. uh, keeps an eye on it for us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that the, the placement of it might be strategic, uh, determining uh, determining uh, first of all who's willing to, to, to keep an eye on it and, and, mm -hmm. and host it for a day or two. That was definitely the intention of the purchase of these signs was to rotate them in areas that staff had received uh, speeding complaints and or council had received complaints so it was uh, the list is not really we haven't formulated a list but i seem to be just the complaints come in and i seem to let it sit for three to four weeks at one location and then we move it again so yeah. so we have a motion that council receives the seventh line north of 20 side traffic report from the director of public works dated october 1st 2019 and that council does not approve the reduction in the speed limit along this stretch of road and that council instructs the director of public works to install one share the road sign at an appropriate location on the seventh line and furthermore that council accepts this report as a review of the fifth line north of hockley road and the fourth line south of 30 side road and deems the current speed limit to be suitable for these roads ways uh, you're going to move that Okay, and second by Magdalo. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That carries. Okay, and the second item is single use plastics uh, staff report from uh, again, uh, Mark Early. Yes, Councillor Nix. Well, <clears throat> staff is looking for directions and I, I I know the original motion said that neither of the senior levels of government had done something by was it December of this year that we would introduce our own bylaw uh, the the downside of that is if you had every municipality in Ontario or Canada doing their own bylaw you'd have a real hodgepodge it would be a mess and this is clearly something either the provincial government or the federal government which by the way you know they say they're going to do something at some point However, they haven't yet. I think we should go ahead. We did give staff a model bylaw for Victoria, which, by the way, is now before the courts out in BC. But they, they do have a model bylaw. The, the only qualification I would make, if this is possible, Mark, is that is that we put up, we, we, we make a progressive and staggered of offense limit in it. In other words, I mean, I think we want to be soft to start with so that, first of all, it's going to be complaint driven. If we get a complaint and, and we send our my law enforcement officer out there and they in fact are using plastic bags, they get a warning letter. That's the first, first offense. Maybe the second time they get a phone call from the mayor. <laughs> what, I, what I'm saying is I don't think we should try and get too draconian right away. Like, like maybe we even have a one year grace period to, to start the bylaw off. The, the, the important thing is I'm still hoping the senior levels of government do do something. And in the meantime, I think Mono has been a leader in a lot of areas like water. Uh, there are a couple of other municipalities now that have single-use plastic bylaws. I think Mono should get out in front and have, have a bylaw too. Okay. Yes. Um, I would agree with Councillor Nix if we could... Uh, have it for six months instead of uh, one year. That that gives everybody six months is a long time, and I would think that by then, are you thinking starting in January, as we have here? Okay. Well, the, the the model bylaw from Victoria, is, as I understand it, is just for plastic bags. Is that where council wants to go, or you want to go with? single-use plastics which I think is I think is going to be on anyways with with the other levels of government um, and if you're going to do that you're affecting a lot of people in the municipality it would be nice to give them some time to get some head dots I think of the resort in particular um, uh, you know they, they probably have and maybe they don't you know single-use plastics the winery that sort of thing so I'd like to see six months with the provision for some uh, letter or, 
one in-person discussion with uh, the uh, retailers in, in the town that uh, may be using plastic. Uh, I'm thinking that TSC is an example, the convenience store, some of the stores in, in Mona Plaza, uh, potentially the resort, and uh, maybe they would be uh, willing to voluntarily uh, convert to something other in the meantime. So you are specifically saying single-use plastic bags as opposed to single-use plastic products. So in other words, takeout containers. Fork knives. Yeah. Little champagne cups. All of those things. I guess you want to report your point of view. Yeah. A different point of view. I guess it's because it depends on the election. <laughs> but uh, uh, on June the 10th, the federal government announced their intention of having a single-use plastic uh, bag uh, bylaw, but they also were uh, indicated, and I have the notes right here, that they're going to do a lot more. Uh, they were going to include uh, straws, cutlery plates, and uh, etc. And also they were interested in pursuing companies to um, be responsible for managing the collection and recycling of the plastic waste. That's a big one, mm -hmm. and if they go for that. And I suspect that if the same government's in, they'll go for it, but it'll take some time before they, they'll have to negotiate and they'll have a lot of pushback. The uh, Canadian Plastic Association did a lot of pushback in Victoria, and that's why the Victoria things were put on hold. And it was on a technicality. It will go ahead because they, they just put it down under business rather than environment. And it'll, it'll go ahead, I'm sure. Um, they also uh, include um, other things that where there's plastic contamination within the environment for particularly marine, and also the con consideration of um, uh, all these um, plastics that are in our uh, um, cosmetics, etc., which are maybe more of an issue than we think. Um, if they're going to go ahead with it, I'm not sure that we should, we should uh, as Fred says, we're going to have a few hundred little municipalities all trying to do this in different ways. It gets, it gets kind of messy for the, uh, for the, the commercial people. Uh, so I'm a little bit soft on it right now, given the, 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 the federal expectations. Uh, if we do do it, uh, we certainly need to give them time. They've got, their, they've got to change their, uh, their, their companies. Uh, uh, the retail people have to change the way they're doing things. They have to um, have some downtime to, to uh, plan for uh, alternatives and using up their, their plastic bags that they have on, on hand. So I guess I'm saying maybe maybe it's not time to do it right now. We should just give it a few more months to see if they're gonna, the feds are going to go ahead with it. So wait until January, which was the original plan that we had, and go from there. But, you know, this is no surprise to any of the companies that you're talking about that this is going to be happening. They know federally. They they know what's happening, and I'm sure that if they follow Mono, they know that that's what we're going to be doing too. So, you know, I don't think the lead-in time has, they don't have six months worth of plastic forks, I'm sure, they, that kind of thing. Anyway, I, I I'm, would be willing to start, wait for January then. With respect to Councillor Bankflow, I still say we should go ahead with something because I think here in this context, it's the message that's more important than we probably won't even have an enforcement issue, you, you know. But if we pass the bylaw and send a message out to our retailers, and maybe the press will pick it up, uh, it's sending a message. Just one more thing: when we were in Victoria and we had takeout. It didn't come in a pla one of those formed plastic things. It came in something that was compostable. It was, you know, it, so those products are already out there. And if we alert the people that we know will be using these products, then they can bring it in themselves, which would really look good for them. So what is the wish of council? Because we have the report from Mr. Early and uh, we also have this uh, original resolution that was passed in 2019. I say there is a resolution on the books. It was passed and our instructions to staff should be carry on. Okay. 
So that's understood by everyone at the table. So then staff, carry on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> After all of us. <laughs> okay, so now we're at uh, the appointed a time for the delegation. So, uh, Mr. Goodrich, if you'd like to come forward and um, use the mic and say a few. And you've got your presentation on the laptop. Just, just before you begin, um, I noticed in your, in your submission that you define the third line uh, as stretching from Hockley Road uh, northbound to the uh, County Road number 8, Lower Sedgwick Road. Um, if it, that's in your definition, but I don't see any recommendations that are, are related to what I would call the section that is south of uh, County Road 8 uh, before you go up into the escarpment area. And just for the record, I live on that stretch of road so if you if you stray into that area in your presentation or as a result of question answering questions i'm going to have to declare an interest specifically on discussions relative to the section of the third line that is directly in front of my property uh, i don't believe i have a, a conflict insofar as the uh, section of road from hockley uh, through the escarpment what I call the escarpment area, but when you come out of the escarpment area in front of the Cardi's property, uh, you're into a stretch of road that is uh, essentially uh, two, uh, two property owners uh, on the uh, west side, myself and, and uh, one other. So if you see me jump up and leave, you'll understand why. Tonight's discussion, I think, will be uh, give you some background. In general, I'll be referring to uh, uh, the document that you have seen. Uh, it was updated on the 21st of September with what I thought was an excellent idea, and uh, we'll probably conclude with that. So to begin with, uh, I'm John Guttridge, my wife Jean. We live at 794033 Third Line. Um, been here for seven years and we truly live in paradise and uh, we want to preserve that. So uh, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. Um, and I'll, I'm not going to read this, I'm just going to refer to portions of it. Uh, so uh, the presentation began with a third uh, line resident inquiring of council when salting of the road for dust abatement might begin. And uh, it snowballed from there um, into an investigation what residents would like to see it happen to the third line. And specifically, um, uh, John, from what you were saying, but specifically from Hockley Road up until Mono Center, which I believe is 5.5 kilometers. Um, now, uh, on the last page of the document, I think I can go there. going to quickly go to the last page here. Um, the residents that you see uh, named here um, stretch from throughout that 5.5 uh, kilometer uh, range and uh, I'm hoping one or two of them will jump in with comments as well. I've just been a scribe and tried to summarize it and bring it all together. Uh, we have two issues. One, I think, is road conditions, and the second one is driving habits. And uh, the, uh, the uh, anecdote that comes to mind is the American and the Brit and the Mono resident flying transatlantic to uh, 
to Europe, and the American turns to the Brit and said, how come you English people drive on the left side of the road? The uh, Brit shot back, how come you Americans drive on the right side of the road? And they both looked at the Mona resident and say, said, where do you drive? And he replied, in Mono, we drive on what's left of the road. And this kind of dovetails into uh, driver habits. And I'm going to go back up. I'm going to go to the page two, which is the summary of what uh, came out of the discussion. So when we sat down and talked about this, we uh, uh, were concerned with 5.5 kilometers, and the first portion is 0.3 km, uh, which is the paved portion. Uh, the next portion, uh, from 794033 to the second bridge, gravel. Third portion, from the bridge to the top of the hill. Uh, third portion is the hill up the 15 side road, and finally the last portion is the escarpment downgrade portion. Problems, uh, road conditions that we saw, uh, blind curves, narrow, no shoulders, uh, potholes, washboard dust, inadequate drainage, uh, then driver habits, excessive speed, and driving in the middle of the road. Um, now, anything that we would suggest uh, council would do, we want to preserve, uh, it's kind of like a do no harm thing. We don't want to change the character of the road. We don't want to straighten curves. Uh, we certainly don't want it paved from one end to the other. We don't want to create a, an alternate to Highway 10 or Airport Road. Uh, this is what I would call my minor tweaking of the conditions. Um, so having said that, let's take a look at uh, uh, the first section. Um, I would add one under potholes. The first section, the paved portion, there's only one, and it recurs every year. The good thing is, if uh, anyone calls um, the town, someone's there to fix it right away. This is good. So part of it is the residents have to uh, call in and report things like this. Um, that section is also prone to flooding in front of uh, there's a, a section that floods every time it rains. And the combination of the pothole on the east side, the flooding on the west side, people tend to automatically drive down the middle of the road. There's a blind corner, obviously. Um, collision avoidance gets to be an issue. Uh, combined with this, an issue with ex excessive speed. Now, where this comes into play specifically is portion B, the 0.2 kilometer section from our address up to the second bridge. People come southbound down off the hill and they hit the gas. Okay, so you've got potholes, you've got washboard. Uh, uh, dust is raised for those particular neighbors. Um, and the excessive speed on gravel and uh, uh, buoy uh, aggregate is an out of control situation. Um, the hill itself, uh, we've got blind curves. Um, it is well graded. The potholes are taken care of. The washboard's taken care of. Case in point today, it's amazing going up that hill today. It's been extremely well maintained. Uh, then you get to the top of the hill, and all of a sudden it's a straightaway. And uh, talk to the local residents 100, 120 kilometers an hour driving on ball bearing gravel. It's a total out of control situation for uh, the touch, slightest touch of the steering wheel is a car in the ditch. Animals hurt, people hurt, you name it. So we have an issue there that we need to deal with. Uh, and then the downgrade through the escarpment. We have hikers, we have people out to see the autumn leaves. Um, it's narrow, there's no place to park, so now you've got combination of people trying to get through north-south, and you've got pedestrians, and you've got uh, 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 parked cars. So that's kind of a situation that we all put up with. Um, 
Now, so how, what do we do about all this? Okay, um, one of the suggestions was portion 1B um, from, since we've already got paving for the first 0.3 kilometers of Hockley, uh, up from Hockley Road, let's pave the second 0.2 kilometers to the second bridge. Okay, that eliminates the potholes. That's a, an old, old road. It's not got a proper road bed. Therefore, it erodes. We get potholes every year. It's, it's well maintained by the town. Paving would fix that. The problem with that is, as soon as we fix that, speed goes up. We get rid of the dust, but now we have excessive speed. Um, we've got people here tonight who will talk anecdotally about uh, uh, having to take cover, uh, pardon me, having to jump in the ditch, pedestrians, to avoid uh, uh, speeding cars out of control. Um, we lost our mailbox to a, uh, a BMW doing a side slide in a snowstorm. Uh, embedding the emblem in my mailbox in the snowbank adjacent. One of those things, people driving too fast for conditions. I don't know how you fix bad driving habits. Um, so, uh, it has been mentioned about paving that section of the road with very much mixed feelings. One idea would be, okay, pave it, but put traffic smoothing uh, measures in place, such as speed bumps. We have winter here. Speed bumps are really going to, they're going to take a beating, first of all. If they don't get plowed off altogether, it's going to slow down the whole operation. So um, we'll just kind of table that. I think we have an idea later on, but traffic calming on that portion um, would be extremely difficult to enforce, and people are not going to slow down anyway. Um, so, so that, I think I can maybe just go straight to enforcement now. Um, anything that we would talk about about road building, um, we, we do not want straight, uh, as I said before, we don't want curves straightened out. Um, we certainly don't want it paved the whole length because that will just create uh, an alternate route and it just this is a part of uh, Mono's heritage in my estimation and we should try and preserve the character as much as possible but it, but also improve safety for residents and visitors so what what did we think we wanted to have done and there was a number of audio, uh, ideas that came out um, point one the town should immediately quantify the scope of our concerns uh, as step one Borrow from Dufferin County, their uh, road cord monitors that determine the volume, direction, and speed of offending traffic. Um, is it a much bigger, is it as big a problem as we feel it is, or is it kind of a second tier problem? Um, improved signage. We have an awful lot of people, visitors, on that road. Um, so, signage, uh, more speed limit sides, no parking signs where appropriate, curve ahead, and reduce speed signs. Uh, an idea that came up uh, from Airport Road is uh, get the OPP eliminated signs where they uh, indicate that it's a traffic enforcement area. Also, uh, the monitors that say what speed you're actually driving. Um, since we've been on the seventh, fourth, third line, pardon me, we've seen the OPP three times. Uh, uh, once, uh, I said I was going to say what I am. During the flood, we had an OPP drive down the driveway and suggest that we, uh, we abandon immediately, move out. Okay, that was one. Second time was when they did a movie shoot uh, for a commercial on the hill last winter, basically saying the road was closed except for get your own home. So. To ask for frequent and random OPP controls, um, it's a good idea. Um, how, how good of a use of uh, OPP time, it's hard to say. Um, very definitely, what we need is reporting. 
and uh, I said here, as distasteful and time consuming as it may seem, residents must begin reporting all incidents of bad driving. Are you forced off the road? Call it in. Put as much information on the offending vehicle as possible. Single car in the ditch? Call it in. The OPP has the ability to render assistance, uh, access the cause of the accident, lay charges if necessary. Uh, and police services can only help us when they became aware of the issues. There's no point in fuming in, uh, in silence. Everyone needs to get a little more proactive. And then what came up on the 21st? And uh, this is rather controversial, but it, it, it seems to have a lot of upsides. So I'm just going to read this. Uh, we're once again referring to the portion that was going to be paved and also the straightaway up at the top of the hill. The benefits of paving or a long stretch of gravel are tempered by the inevitable increase in speeding despite any calming effects that would complicate snow removal and probably do little to defer, deter speeding. A resident who has been driving exclusively in Metro Toronto has brought forward a best of both worlds idea worthy of consideration. Metro successfully petitioned the province for the use of photo radar in school zones. The, initial, the initiative has been successful in re reducing speed because the registered vehicle owner is fined. Fining offenders is a sob sobering deterrent on speeders, even if they only think photo radar may be present. Uh, we would like the town of Mono to petition the province for the use of photo radar on any road with a history of dangerous speeding once we quantify that. Uh, we know there's an issue with Hockley Road, uh, and obviously the newspaper every week uh, points out the issues on Airport Road where we get 130, 150, 170 people pulled over speeding. Uh, we would benefit from safer roads. I'm assuming there would be a revenue stream that would uh, revert to Mono. And the other thing with photo road or radar for the naysayers, it can be set with a built-in tolerance of five to seven kilometers per hour, let's say, as an overspeed buffer. So uh, if you're trying to maintain the speed limit, it's very easy to exceed it by five to seven km. Those people shouldn't be punished. We're looking at people a lot driving a lot faster than that and out of control. Um, so I've kind of gone through this. Um, I have copies of this available, and uh, I'd be very grateful for any comment from anyone um, that uh, could put a spin on it. Um, and uh, I can answer any questions uh, as, we, as we go from there. Thank you very much. Uh, any members of council would like to uh, question or have any uh, comments on the presentation? Yes, will be mayor. Thank you for the, the presentation. Um, and as we didn't stray uh, north of uh, the escarpment zone, I think I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Um, we've gone through an exercise uh, involving uh, what we call our Community Safety Task Force. And uh, the uh, first draft of that document has been submitted to the committee for their consideration. And they're going to have at it and chew it apart and send it back. Uh, but one of the key recommendations of that uh, report is uh, what we call automated speed enforcement, otherwise known as photo radar. And it can come in two forms. It could come as a, as a fixed uh, location or it can come more commonly as a, as a portable unit that you can take to different areas in your community that are uh, experiencing a problem. The difficulty is that the province so far is only willing to allow those to be established in community safety zones. And that's why the City of Toronto is rolling them out in proximity to schools and, and other areas. We just don't have the traffic volume in proximity to our schools, which are usually community safety zones, uh, to justify the use of that very expensive equipment. However, one of our recommendations to the province is going to be to loosen up your criteria and allow municipalities to deploy um, uh, automated speed enforcement in places that 
cry out for it. And this is, I think, one of those areas. Uh, the other thing, if you may have noticed a discussion about the seventh line earlier this evening, and uh, we, have, uh, we have done some traffic count uh, speed uh, measurement there, and I'd like to see that, uh, that occur in, in your uh, immediate neighborhood as well to give us a, a sense of you know, what sort of problem we have. Um, so you'll find that the, the report of the task force, once it's made public, uh, will have a lot of suggestions that I think will help uh, your particular situation. Yeah, I, I think this is an excellent report and I, I compliment you on the, the care with which you presented this. However, having said that, here comes the however. Um, I, I, I am going to actually recommend that we receive this report and give you my suggestion that we have a motion and that we turn it over to Public Works that, and that, that's as opposed to us acting on any of these recommendations and I'll tell you why there are other people who live in parts of Nova who have roads with road problems too and if we start handling our roads or any improvements to them on kind of an ad hoc basis waiting for citizens groups to come in I think we get into trouble. My own preference would be, Mike, that we had a road plan in 2012. I know you say council never formally adopted it, but I kind of use it as my guide. It has all of our bridges, when they'll be inspected, and when we think they'll be replaced, various little sections of the roads that will someday see some asphalt paving if the traffic volumes reach a certain point, and, and everything. It was a either a 10 or 20 year plan. I, I, I'm, I can't remember how many years it was. My suggestion would be then that your report, first of all, I think that report should be updated. I think council should formally adopt it if we neglected to do so in 2012. And then I would use this as some input to it. And I would wait for our director of public works to come back with his recommendations as to how many of these recommendations we accept in, in the road plan. Mr. Mitchell? <laughs> I appreciate you uh, the work you put into this and uh, bringing this together in a uh, in a very uh, sober manner. Um, the uh, I've talked to the director of public works. I think that he's uh, um, has a uh, uh, a bit of a handle on this, and that he's the appropriate person to uh, uh, have a look at it and come back to council with recommendations. So I I very much support your suggestion. Yes, thank you very much, John, for bringing it. It's, I, I have to admit, I know other people live other places, but I have to admit that uh, the third line is one of my favorite drives in Mono, and um, I'm really glad that you brought this report. It's quite thorough, and, and I am in agreement with uh, Councillor Nix that the next step would be to bring it to um, our Director of Public Works, to bring it to Mike Dunmore and uh, proceed from there. Uh, thank you, I think that, uh, I wasn't aware there was a, a road plan, um, and I think this might be good input to that, that uh, document, that committee. Um, and what we've done is tabled some ideas, and it can become part of the bigger picture. two other, other things. Uh, you mentioned what I would uh, presume to be a neighborhood watch uh, type of situation where residents are alive to uh, issues of speeding and reckless driving and, and report those. Uh, likewise, condition of the road. Uh, Mike knows that I have him on speed dial when I drive down there and uh, there are potholes um, and it's, it's, it's a very hard section of road. It may be one of the most difficult sections of roads in the town to maintain. Uh, having said that, uh, that's, that's a, a, a maintenance challenge and I think we're up to, to doing a, a good job on that. Um, I don't want to see your concerns uh, necessarily lost in a global uh, treatment of, of road um, aspirations for the next 10 or 15 years. I think we do need to look at the, uh, the, the, the 
questions that you've raised, and one which is uh, near and dear to, to me is why we maintain uh, a default uh, speed of 80 kilometers per hour on sections of road that are significantly narrower than other sections of road where you wouldn't want to be driving 80, but let's put it this way, you sure wouldn't want to be driving 80 on those narrow sections of road and through the escarpment area is one such section of road. There are others in the town and I think we need to look at all of them because they could stand to be reduced in speed but I'm not generally a, a, a person who argues for um, speed limit reductions across the board but I think there are some circumstances out there that, uh, that call for it. And, and I, I agree, I, I have a heavy foot, but I'm, I think, well aware of, tra of road conditions, uh, perhaps more than a lot of, uh, shall we say, city people, visitors. Um, but, uh, where was I going with that? Uh, I lost it. <laughs> the heavy foot part, yeah, that, 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 that did it. But. So I agree there's sections where postage speed should be well brought to people's attention, maybe even with flashing lights if that's possible, solar light saying this is, you really need to pay attention here. And that's where I was going with that idea. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Goodrich. Um, I would suggest then that um, if somebody's prepared to put a motion on the floor, I would put the motion on the floor that we ask the Director of Public Works to review these uh, concerns and bring us back a, a full report on this particular situation. And then secondly, uh, the possibility of the update of the, it's a 20 year capital plan, isn't it? Or is that the, uh, or are we talking about the road and bridges? So the, the plan that council liked but didn't adopt yeah. Um, we're, uh, we're probably about seven million behind yeah. um, because the government grant stopped basically when that we were receiving approximately uh, one million a year in grants I would say when that plan was created and the expectation was that we'd move forward with that um, so council will recall that we've been doing a lot of bridges um, and avoiding uh, not so much avoiding but reevaluating our rehabilitation of roads uh, that parallel our ministry highways and so forth. Um, inside the development charges bylaw um, and the development charges work, there was money set aside for a roads need update study. Um, in discussions with Madam Mayor, we, we took this approach as to not just globalize this into uh, when to rehab or when to pave a road. We wanted to look at width, um, risk factors, um, and, and different items such as that and, and, and whether we would uh, uh, repave a road when a bridge was about to fail and things like that. So it, so it, was, uh, it was set aside in the uh, development charges study and that money sits there and uh, I have the quotes in-house now. I'm, I'm just trying to review them and I was hoping to get it for this budget year but it will not happen so it'll probably, that, that will be something that is a working document that should come out 2020, 2020 some, sometime. So that will be town-wide and that'll incorporate my roads plan that I presented to council in 2012 and, uh, and, also, um, and also items such as this that are being generated. Um, I did have a few comments on the delegation if council wishes. Um, I think it's appropriate when we have third line residents in, in house tonight. Um, um, I'm happy it came this way. This is this is a great way for residents to come see council because we met in the spring, I believe, was when we first started. Um, I explained to the residents at that time that everybody wants cal calcium first, um, and I've explained to council that more money and more employees will get you calcium first, right? So there is a there is a downfall of uh, of the needs. We have to wait till the roads are dry. Um, Council is well aware that we suffered a, we're suffering a climate-based uh, issue with our gravel right now. Um, while we use an OPS spec gravel, 
um, with the types of winters that we are seeing with the multiple freezing thaws and especially in areas where we don't have adequate drainage which is the pothole that reoccurs in the asphalt on the inside corner because there's no place for a ditch um, that's where the alligator cracking and there is a pothole um, across the road is an easy fix in my mind the grass shoulder needs to be removed to allow the water to get off um, so that's something that section of pavement is being identified in the next couple of years to be replaced um, your comments on not putting uh, putting asphalt over or a bad base very very appropriate there's houses in the vicinity of uh, in between the two bridges right where, right where the potholes and there's absolutely no drainage on the south and west side of the road um, for that for that section of all that drainage goes back towards a couple residents there and I believe that the I'm, I'm thinking it was the miss that's shaking her head up and down that receives the majority of the water uh, during a rain event um, so solutions have to be brought there and that may be piping and catch basins as such as you suggested in your uh, in your document so um, for council the total rehab of this was estimated at 3.5 million from Hockley to County Road 8 so I'm glad that uh, that we're not doing we're not suggesting that it takes your canopy out it takes your trees out it looks for uh, road widenings and, and property uh, requests right so um, so there is what we did on here Ontario was we put the crusher run limestone on we haven't really seen the results with respect to that in the spring yet because um, we're not there um, but that is an option to try in between the two bridges um, that's a short-term solution to see how it works through the winter um, today what the residents saw was uh, was limestone screenings mixed in with granular being applied to the hill and we're trying to we did that all the way along the Hockley Valley north and south uh, over the last couple of weeks we're trying to slow down the reoccurring washboard and, uh, and potholes uh, after rain so um, I agree with a lot of the content in the report I had come up I had quite a bit of points that I think would be better probably put into a formal report that way the residents can see it but being the time of year that it is I didn't know how fast council was looking to um, are you looking for something for a 2020 install or or are we looking for a Realistically, I could probably have a report back by mid-November. I don't know if that'll meet our budget timeline for it. Um, with respect to our operation, our cap capital was October 22nd. Um, there is capital components of this, of the solutions that I was thinking of, um, but the majority may be able to take under contracted materials. Um, so yes, I couldn't bring a report back. Sorry, that was a long-winded. Uh, okay. Well, I, I guess my concern is just to make sure that's identified that we aren't going to put this on the shelf and wait until a larger global report was provided uh, that mm -hmm. you could, uh, very similar to what we did with the seventh line, mm -hmm. bring back uh, potential solutions. It doesn't necessarily mean that if you're suggesting some uh, capital upgrades that it has to be um, identified specifically for 2020 budget, but at least you have a plan that you think that would um, be worthwhile pursuing. So if you're comfortable with that, and if the rest of the council agrees with that direction, then so so what I as a minimum will add to the list our solar uh, our solar radar. Um, sign I'd like to get a sense of where the speeding is the best uh, so we put that in the right spot um, I was down there this afternoon many people walking and uh, there's hints at no parking signs in here I'm pretty sure that the cars parked today were probably the own, your own residence right so um, so so there's 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 twofold session uh, one 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 report I would like you to read though is the speed hump Humps and bumps report that I did in 2012. It lists the pros and cons. It's uh, council session uh, uh, 
uh, 13-2012. If you go back, you'll see the report, and, and that may give you some better feeling on the cons, the cons of uh, rumble strips and uh, and speed bumps. And uh, but as a minimum, I can do the volume speed study. Hopefully, I can get our contractor back in to to do the volume speed study. Um, but I would like to know because I I just can't. I can't envision somebody going over 40 through the pavement section, but it happens if they drive on the wrong side of the road and, and take the corners like race cars, right? Um, so I, I also had a note here about painting the center line of that road, um, whether that would actually keep people on the right traveled lane. So, so that's a possibility as well. So. I don't know that this is a capital consideration so much as it's operational, but uh, I really like the idea of giving serious consideration to using the uh, uh, the um, uh, better granular uh, between the bridges uh, and seeing whether or not that will uh, alleviate some of the issues. If it's working up on here, Ontario, um, do we have some that we can uh, apply down there? We should have budget for that. It should be, it's probably the same corduroy base that's on here in Ontario that's causing, well, and the lack of drainage. So it's something that we could definitely try. Um, we may have to take, just so residents are aware, we may have to take four to five inches of the existing A gravel off, uh, which is done by grader, uh, to put this on because uh, we don't want to raise these houses, way, these road way above your driveways because you're already getting runoff from the road. So, it, uh, so it's definitely a, half day to a, a day project that could uh, commence uh, um, subject to our time in the public works department. But the speed volume survey, I think that's probably, this is going to be valuable information for the roads need study for council, um, for the residents as well. Um, I would just uh, sort of look for direction as to where that speeding is happening because I understand in the flats up above the hill and to, to the Dunby, um, that makes sense that there would be speeding there. Um, but but through those hills and uh, um, and down in the lower valley, I would uh, um, I would like to hear where you would like to see it because I, I just don't I I have trouble I struggle a little bit with where the resin where the drivers would be speeding right. Um, I believe the Wicks Wixons might make some comment on the straightaway up there. You uh, have firsthand information. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So right now I would find that road to be in a state of repair that's acceptable to the uh, town. I know exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about the spring conditions. We're struggling with that town wide. Um, the public works budget for next year will have multiple places for this gravel provided it functions properly in the spring. Um, we're trying, we're just sort of in a hold, holding and because it's, if you drive here Ontario north of County Road 8 right now, it's rock hard and we're a little concerned about what it will do in the spring months with and over the winter months with respect to ice and that, whether it will... Uh, whether it will turn into an ice rink and it'll be hard to uh, to maintain, or whether it'll perform exactly like we hope it will perform, which is better than the dirty gravel that generally is happening right now. So um, we would have enough room budget-wise to be in between the bridges, and I think we're probably starting to stretch our gravel budget right now to start to do a stretch Two, two kilometers, two kilometers long, roughly, we're, we're starting to push our budget, I think, unless council wanted to approve a small amendment. Oh, I would, yeah. Yes.
basically as soon as you start to lower the speed limit, then the signage has to be more uh, frequent. So the, the section of road from Hockley to 10 side road is 40 kilometers as it stands right now. Um, there's a, I noticed tonight there is a sign missing. Uh, I saw a, a blank post out there, so, so that should be corrected. Um, as you, um, yes, so, so there is signs there. There's also, uh, there's also at the top of the hill coming south and, and at Hockley Road heading north, there's also a, uh, um, a windy curve warning sign with a slow down tab with a for the next two kilometers tab that went in uh, two years ago at a residential at some residential discussions so it really boils down to how much signage do you want um, because we can plaster it yellow um, you know and, and, and how much and that is there's a, a number of uh, blind curves uh, there. Um, have we ever explored the notion of the, um, um, I don't know, are they parabolic mirrors that allow you to uh, see oncoming uh, cars, vehicles? So similar to the unposted speed limits, I can't seem to find any history and I, I struggle as a driver to understand distracted driving, what's worse, <laughs> doing this or looking up at a sign I struggle with it, right? And I, I, you see them a lot in, uh, in cottage areas, and I think they're residential driven. Um, I don't know of any municipalities or if there's anything, um, King Township has them. Um, I just don't know of the legalities of it. I guess Be, being a man of the courts would, would, <laughs> <laughs> would, uh, would I was looking at the parabolic sign to try to see if somebody was coming when I had a head-on collision be an acceptable? I, I just don't know the liability. I just don't know the. I struggle. I struggle with uh, the town being involved in creating a, 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 a piece of equipment that enables you to see around a blind corner, um, forty feet up a pole. I struggle with it. I'm sorry. I can't. I just can't find any background I data. Just, I just wanted to throw it into the yeah. mix. And, yeah. And I looked. I tried to see if there was such a thing, and I don't. Uh, I don't see anything from a municipal perspective as to the installation. So you think all of the ones that we've all seen, I think, at various times, have been put up by residents as opposed to the municipality? I just don't know. I just don't know. Mr. Lilly may have some background. I drive I, my cottage road. It's it's a vertical blind curve. So it's this way, and uh, they they have a, a, a mirror set up at the top of the hill, and I actually find it totally distracting to be looking at the mirror trying to see what's coming because I have hit a car at the top, not hit them, but met them at the top, and uh, you, you just don't see the cars coming until they're there too. So I don't find it helpful. I find it's easier to honk as I'm coming over the top. I really that, think, but that's a different situation. Yeah. That's that's blind this way. As Similar, but I really think the goal here is to keep people on the right side of the road, proper speed, and, uh, and drive according to the conditions. And if that can be done through some signage, center line painting, um, some warning signs, some caution signs. If it moves 50% of the drivers over the right lane, then we were 50% positive, right? Like, like we, we, as pub from a public works perspective, and, and I know council is trying to figure this out, 
we can't correct bad driving and I wish we could and yeah yeah and it seems to be getting faster and we're trying and we can put a little bit of effort into trying and we get solutions for half the drivers and I think we've come farther than what we were today or yesterday I guess yeah okay well we've gone uh, through the uh, presentation and thank you very much and uh, I think Mr. Dunmore has uh, the uh, direction from council uh, so uh, thank you very much for attending and I'm sure that uh, you'll be reading our upcoming agendas to see when the item comes back out again so thank you and once again thank you uh, for everyone's input um, I think something good is going to come out of this mm -hmm. certainly we're all aware aware of it now and uh, uh, we look forward to something happening in the future yeah. We appreciate your time. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Okay, so now we have our next delegation is David Naren from Theatre Orangeville. Mr. Naren. Did you drive a white truck? And like Councillor Martin, I love that drive and uh, will confess that I perhaps, that I know that I have. I didn't know it was 40. <laughs> and I apologize for that. But you don't drive a white truck. <laughs> well, it's sort of white. So. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't drive a white truck. Um, thank you very much. I just wanted to, I'm, I'm here just very quickly. I just wanted to say thank you. I wanted to thank council and the town for their support of the uh, Dream at Island Lake project. Uh, those of you who are able to attend it, I know that some of you, and I'm sure some of you were not able to attend, and I'm sure you all have a very good reason, but we'll see you out there in the future. Um, the, uh, the event was spectacular. I, I think it's one of the finest events that we've ever produced, and it was because of you and your support that we were able to make it happen. Uh, approximately 1,700 people uh, came out over the course of the four performances to see the show. Uh, I think we learned our lesson that we wouldn't do a Saturday matinee anymore, and that was the really, that was the really difficult sell. Um, but uh, everyone... Um, Everyone loved the experience. I think bringing, uh, we had a, quite a number. I, it's a little bit anecdotally, but I would say we had at least 300 of our patrons who identified that they were coming from outside of our immediate community here. Um, that a lot of them are actually coming up from Toronto. So it was great that they were able to experience what the Mono experience is um, with this project, with the, with the production. Um, we were, um, as I, I think I mentioned to, to you when I was here uh, before, uh, before we did the production, um, in terms of us moving forward, the operating budget for the, pro for the project was $100,000. That was outside of the operating budget of Theater Orangeville. Um, we fundraise within the community. We receive grants and support from corporate and uh, service clubs. And I'm thrilled to say that the project broke even, which is what we strive for. I, well, I guess that's what we, we're happy with in the not-for-profit arts world. If we can, if we can break even on the show, we're pretty darn happy. So uh, we were able to do that. Um, moving forward, um, our, our young company will, of course, be out there again next summer. Uh, we discovered that the real magic of the experience is that we're able to do it at night uh, with the lighting system that we're able to bring in um, and, uh, and make the project work that way. Um, given that it is, in fact, a $100,000 project, I don't think we're not going to be in a position to do that every year on that scale and of that magnitude. But it is our goal to do it every second or third year, probably is a bit more realistic, to do it on that scale where we're bringing together professional actors um, and to be doing it on that scale the size of set and, and, and what we were able to do out there um, I think that I also want to thank you uh, those of you who did an opportunity to see it was that it was one of our finest moments in terms of being able to bring community together true community together um, regardless of what is perceived to be talent ability to to do that, we brought together so many different facets of our community. And of course, by as always, even though we're called Theater Orangeville, our family and our community extends far beyond that with patrons coming from, with subscribers and attendees to that event coming from, on a regular basis, coming from uh, Collingwood, Newmarket, down into Brampton and as far over as into the north end of Guelph. So that's our draw. That's who we consider to be. And that's where people were coming from to see it and they were experiencing it here. And uh, so we do have plans to move forward with this kind of project again in the future. I think that the space um, has unbelievable potential. 
to be used for a variety of events. My, st my belief is still that it's, its real strength and, and usability or frequency of use is going to be around music. There's been a lot of interest expressed around dance, around perhaps a folk festival moving there, um, that kind of thing. So it has tremendous potential. It's a world-class, it has the potential to be a world-class venue and to attract world-class artists to a world-class community um, to experience what that is. And um, I think that the, the future for that venue uh, depending on how where CVC land on their plans to or what is doable in order with that space um, there's trim, the potential for the space is only limited by our imagination or lack thereof and uh, making these kind of similar things happen so uh, that's really just why I'm here just to say thank you thank you unless much. there's questions the, the pool is now reading off the hook from certain residents in Iowa Lake subdivision quote <laughs> proceed is coming and, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry Councillor Nix I missed we, the we have some people in Iowa Right, yes. They don't like the fact that there are events there because right. it creates noise. I will say I have been really Right. I'm sure you of course. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure there will be. Um and I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm not discounting it. Um, just by way of, of um, when we first, uh, it will be about three years ago. Well, actually, it's probably four if I really sat down and did the math. We did a, a test concert there, which I think we shared the, the sound results with you. Um, and one of the residents came to me that afternoon and said, the second I hear anything, I'm going to be down here. And I said, here's my cell phone. Here's my number. Please call me. When we were 45 minutes into the event and that person called to ask if we had started yet, I just, you know, I'm not discounting it and I certainly respect it. Um, I, th I would seek perhaps counsel's advice um, before I answered that question. I'm not, it, it, it was a concern per, and I, and I completely respect it and I completely, um, I, I think it's interesting too what's happened in the venue in terms of uh, maybe it's a public work or public safety could speak to it because of the structure now the geese don't come into that little into that area the same way um, apparently only drunk fishermen come in um, which happened to us on Saturday night when two guys who were pretty toasted just walked through the middle of it right literally through the middle of it it was quite disconcerting but um, uh, but it's it's sort of changed that pattern so the, the birds don't come in so when we're where the actual slope is, is that we would need, you know, we'd be spending a day and a half just sort of shoveling it out to clean it up. That doesn't exist anymore. So it's just, and as you know, that Crescent Beach had a very checkered past in terms of when it was open and when it was closed based on fecal count and birds coming in and stuff like that. So <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, so I completely appreciate that there are residents there who, um, I, I will say that we've also had tremendous support from residents there in terms of ticket buyers and people who appreciate the uniqueness of the event. If we were putting death metal bands in there every Friday night for six months, I can certainly see, I, I'd be the first one, I'd, I'd be along, right along with them. Um, but um, I, I completely appreciate and respect the, um, their concern. I certainly appreciate the number of community groups that you had working there. I had that were on stage, that were singing behind me. It was Thursday night that I was there and a heater would have been nice. It was a little chilly or a blanket, but it was a, it was a fabulous production. And I kind of resent when people call it noise. You know, that really bothers me a lot when there's a something as wonderful as that going on and there would be, it would be considered noise. It, it was a really, I almost went twice, but you know. I appreciate that, Councilor. I mean, um, it was also interesting in that it was a spoken word presentation, as opposed to a band. I mean, there was a musical component of, of the uh, the of the um, the Orangeville chorus, the sweet ads of thirty unmiked voices. And there was there was amplification. We were actors were on headset, but it was spoken word. It was not uh, it was not a band. It was not a uh, the musical support was all acoustic for the show so it was just that I, I just find that as an interesting comment as well 
Um, but yeah, it was a it was a it was a great event, and um, as I say, hopefully we'll the, the pushback on it came with Shakespeare. I don't know about that. I don't know about that Shakespeare thing. Um, you know, we as as usual, the show went on. We had an actor two days before we opened who broke she broke her ankle, um, and that was a, a whole thing. But the part was originally written to be played by a man, and it was so. That's how we. That's how we. <laughs> that's how we overcame. David, I'd, I'd encourage you to continue. Uh, I attended there on one frigid night as well, so I'll take a blanket the next time. But it's a fantastic site. Aesthetically, it's hard to beat. So you you just can do nothing but improve. Well, CBC, thanks, Cal. CBC, I know had we we've, we've had some initial just they we because we consult on it because of the the nature of it. Um, but they're thinking of you know uh, proper tiering of it. One of the one of the areas of real concern was um, was the exiting at night and uh, albeit a million volunteers I mean there were over 200 people that worked on the project at any given time um, with flashlights and helping people with their cars there was that concern the the whole idea of it actually was based on an experience that I had about 20 years ago in Carmel California at the Forest Theater which was, at that time was a hundred year old amphitheater that exists right in the center of Carmel and as you may or may not know the city of Carmel does not have street lights anywhere when you walk out of your house to your car, there is no, there are no street lights anywhere in the city of Carmel. It's, it's a, it's a bylaw. It's a thing. It's what they do. Um, and everybody who walked out of the theater that night took a flash after Peter Pan took their flashlight with them. So um, there's, there's a huge learning curve. There's lots of every time there's lessons learned around uh, power, around all that kind of stuff, and being respectful of what the venue is. But I agree with you, Councillor. It's a remarkable, remarkable um, asset to the community. And you, when used properly, and when used in conjunction with with the wishes of the community, I think is has tremendous, tremendous opportunity for the town um, to to realize um, tourism alone. I think is is really kind of an interesting thing. Um, we are. It was cold that night. The night before, on the Wednesday night, we were in the pouring rain because um, the only thing that stopped the sh would stop the show would be lightning. Once, well, no, really, once that starts, then we need to shut it down. But the gear, everything is specially built for outdoor use and for rain. So uh, we, we luckily didn't have it during the show. So we'll negotiate somehow the temperature next year. Um, it's also because of the way that the stage is situated. Um, I'm in negotiations right now, and they're going very well. But apparently it's a union discussion. Um, there's unions involved. I would need the sun to set just about two degrees further to the west, and then it won't be in anybody's eyes at sunset as it goes down. Um, but it was a, a, my favorite experience, or my favorite thing was uh, when Dan, who was playing uh, Hermia, the young woman, one of the lovers, um, when he said, um, what ho, Lord, no voice, no word, no sound, and the geese went over top. <laughs> Into the setting sun, it was spectacular. But um, again, thank you just for your support and uh, support of, um, of the cultural uh, life of this community. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Unless there's coming. any yeah. questions. Okay. Okay, so now we are on to our bylaws correspondence new business and uh, number one, the 2020 OPP annual billing statement. So the report from Mr. Haluka. Is there anything that you wanted to add to your report, Mr. Haluka? Uh, just want to remind council, I'm sure you, you're aware, the contract does expire, our current one, at the end of this year. So the OPP is asking uh, for what term you would like. Uh, the current contract was for four years, 2015 to 2019. So we're recommending the same thing. That gives the next council time to think about another renewal. Uh, we were told at any time during the four-year period, this council is considering perhaps increasing the enhancement. Um, that can be done during the, you know, the term of the contract. At any time, just a simple amendment. I, I understand it can be done at any time, and I've perhaps forgotten that. But still, if we were thinking of doing it any time in 2020, we should put we should be putting it in the into in the next budget. If, if we're thinking of doing that, we can't just get into the middle of 2020 and say, "Oh, we'd like OPP would like to have this enhancement." Well, I mean, that's a valid point. Uh, as in my memo, uh, three quarters of an officer is about 97,000. Uh, 
just bumping it up to say 100% a full time officer, it's about 130,000. Uh, so if council wants to go to say two officers, then it's about 160. Oh, no, that's absolutely correct. With the budget coming, you get two different officers. Yeah, I, I, I don't see a, a difficulty in as much as uh, uh, the draft of the report is circulating now to the members of the committee. Uh, the wording of the draft uh, leaves open uh, the issue of uh, an enhancement increase uh, of either 50% or 100%. And the suggestion is that it utilize the existing $20,000 that we currently spend on paid duty. So that assists us to uh, reduce the, uh, the pain of, of additional monies towards increasing uh, an enhancement. And I suspect we'll, we'll have that decision uh, in, in well and sufficient time with the budget considerations. But this is quite, quite different in as much as they simply need to know that uh, that we're renewing number one and, and, and not going with another police force. Oh, I'm only kidding. Uh, <laughs> they weren't. And, they weren't when I spoke with them. <laughs> <laughs> they and, wanted us. They want us to know. And and uh, and what what length of uh, uh, duration of the contract? And I, I support a four year. I think that's appropriate. So if there's no further discussion, a uh, motion that council directs staff to inform the OPP that the town of Mona would like to enter into a four-year agreement with the OPP for the provision of police services commencing January 1st, 2020. Do we have a mover? Moved by Martin and seconded by Creelman. Any discussion? All in favor? That carries. Okay, item two, the request for use of town's headwaters trademark. And there's a report from Mr. Early. Any questions regarding the report? Okay, seeing none, we have a motion that council directs staff to authorize Stone Creek Resorts, Inc. of Calgary, Alberta, the right to use the town's trade bark headwaters for use in association with hotel accommodation services, recreational services, food and beverage services, and spa services. <coughs> and yeah. Be nice if we got. <laughs> and could I have a mover? Moved by Mix and seconded by Mankalo. Any further discussion? All in favor? Pardon? Glad they're, Glad they're asking, yeah, for sure. So that carries. Item three Pol Police Service Board Resolution of Advice, OPP Enforcement of Bylaws. Yes, Mr. Yes. Um, sure, but okay. So the motion that council directs staff to investigate the feasibility of entering into a memorandum of understanding with Dufford OPP for the enforcement of specified town of Mono bylaws, moved by Creelman and seconded by Martin. And the question. My my question. First of all, and I, I guess this is my ignorance. By, pe by putting this motion forward, you're telling me that in fact now the OPP cannot enforce our bylaws. So I, I'm thinking, I mean, the county has, for example, no parking bylaws. The OPP will enforce them. Is that because the county has, has a memorandum of, of understanding with the OPP? No, the, the OPP's enforcement of, of parking uh, bylaws is, is simply informal now. Uh, what they want is to, to sort of have something uh, that formalizes their understanding that they will uh, enforce uh, the parking bylaw as an example, or if we can find any other bylaws that would be appropriate. Some would not be appropriate, but there may be something out there that, uh, that would be appropriate. So this is simply asking staff to uh, to go through our bylaws, identify anything that uh, that we can ask the OPP to uh, involve itself with. That was going to be my second question. Did, did you have a certain bylaws I, in mind? I don't have any off the top of my head, but uh, there may be there may be something out there. It could be fairly obscure, uh, but uh, parking obviously is is the big one, uh, and current 
probably uh, parking enforcement is, uh, I wouldn't say uh, we're generating maybe 10 tickets a year or something like that. Uh, it's not big, but it could theoretically become uh, more important as we look at our roads and safety issues and so forth. Sorry to keep you off, but yeah, I have three. I, I'm all in favor of passing the bylaws, and we'll look at which bylaws we want to enforce. Does that affect the contract? I mean, if 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 we decide that there's ten bylaws we want the OPP to start enforcing, which they haven't been doing in the past, that presumably increases their workload, right? So th does that change the nature of the contract, or, or, or does it change the nature of their workload? I, I, I don't know how that would. I think that's a question for Nikki. My, my 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 comment on the previous question was: This is a lot like the pool bylaw that you dealt with last week, where the county's been doing it for years, but they never really had that formal authority. So we could pass the bylaw to give them the authority. Uh, I ran into this probably five years ago with our noise bylaw, and the OPP basically said. We can't enforce your noise bylaw. We don't have any authority to, to really get into it. But what we can do is the whole disturbing of the peace component that they get the authority to under their own legislation. They're quite willing to deal with that. Uh, noise bylaw is a p potential option of a, of a bylaw for them to look at. Councilor so. Michael? Uh, just looking at how this is going to play out, uh, does this mean that we're going to have a list of bylaws that are bylaws that they're enforces and what a list that the OPP enforces? Well, I think it's just the, the additional presence that we would get from the OPP on certain bylaws. It may not be necessary all the time to have them there. Um, but if we know we're going to have an issue, they're, they're available. Correct. Okay, so a uh, motion has been put on the floor, moved and second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? It carries. Motion by Deputy Mayor Creelman regarding electoral reform task force. Deputy Mayor. Uh, I, I introduced this in the wake of uh, Bob McCray's presentation uh, at our last meeting. Um, I was a little concerned that, uh, that we strike another task force with uh, three <coughs> task forces outstanding, but given the fact that we're now um, into the writing phase of the Community Safety Task Force, I feel comfortable with uh, seeing this proceed. It is uh, reflected in our, um, in our um, mission statement, or uh, I'm not certain whether I'm characterizing that correctly. Uh, it's going to take time. I, I don't see this being done overnight, but I think it, it sends a signal that we're going to have to do some research and, and get some questions answered with regard to uh, uh, ranked ballot option system uh, option and, and uh, there may be other things out there as well but um, we do have deadlines to meet in terms of uh, provincial uh, requirements and I think the sooner we, uh, we do this so my hope is that this will pass uh, we will uh, place an ad for uh, members uh, determine membership uh, at some point and uh, uh, let the, uh, the group uh, do its work uh, with, with no with no urgency, but I don't see this being something that is going to be uh, um, is going to be terribly onerous, apart from maybe doing some of the research. Councillor Mitchell, uh, this is an issue that that keeps rearing its head, and uh, uh, I think we need to deal with it. So I, I support this idea. I think it's uh, is appropriate, uh, and uh, we can come up with um, a group of people who are interested in sitting on this task force. That's going to be the critical thing. Any other questions or comments? I, I would just say, I mean, I'll, I'll go along with it, but I'm not, I'm not really sure we, we need another task force. Um, we've made changes to the electoral process in the past since we tried council making a decision. Well, when we went to a council, we didn't have a task force to tell us where council was voting. My, my memory was yeah. it was just council that made that decision. We didn't yeah. set up a task force. Well, we did have, um, I believe, a report that came through from a, a 
group of, of citizens looking at the issue of going back to the polling stations. But after that particular uh, election and the, the low voter turnout, the next council chose to go back to the uh, electronic voting. So correct. You know, so we sort of took that process along. I think that we have made the steps to make our elections accessible. I don't think that, I, I can't see how a ranked ballot would have made any difference to the election that we had. And um, as for a ward system, I have no idea how that would work. Maybe that's why you need to have a task force, but I can't see how it could possibly work here. We have, we have uh, what, 9,000 people? How many are voters? We're somewhere around three to about. How many, how many uh, voting eligible voters were in the last election, Mr. Simpson? Um, 3,000 and change? Uh, guesstimate is allowed. 4,000. Yeah, okay. So, no, I can't, I, I can't jump on this bandwagon, so thanks. I, I don't think anyone is, is asking uh, where you stand on these two issues. Uh, the question is, do we want to have a, a, a orderly process by which we can consider the options? And I think that is important and it is materially different than asking for a staff report because if we went with a ranked ballot uh, or if we went with a ward system that's uh, fundamentally changing uh, uh, voting it's not simply a mechanical exercise of whether we have a paper ballot versus the internet. Uh, this is something that, that profoundly impacts uh, the way we vote. And I'll just make one editorial comment. I think one of the reasons our democracy is in, in the shape it's in, and I don't think it's in great shape, is the first past the post uh, uh, voting system. And uh, it, it is very hard to, to know whether a ranked ballot um, makes a difference or not. Uh, and certainly it depends on multiple candidates, not simply more than two candidates. It, it uh, assumes that there might be a third or a fourth. Uh, and hopefully there are a third and a fourth for each of the positions that are uh, up for election. Uh, but at least a ranked ballot system, and again, I, I, I did say that it doesn't matter tonight, uh, but uh, ranked ballot ensures that whoever does get elected gets elected with 50% uh, of the vote, uh, either directly or indirectly. Well, I understand all the semantics about this. The, my, my issue is, is that as uh, an individual sitting in an elected position, I don't think I know enough about what our residents want us to do. I would prefer to see this uh, considered as... Uh, a referendum item for the next election to see what interest there is in the voting public out there to make any adjustments. Um, I, I don't see anybody else within our own county has decided to change their method of, of uh, electoral process or even considering a board system. So I, I struggle with this because the, the in the two items that were used to say that this is something you should consider um, were municipalities that were, what, six or eight times the size we are. And, and so there, there doesn't seem to be any balance for me. So at any rate, um, and also I am concerned, um, the task force could come forward with a unanimous decision that this is the direction we're supposed to go, let's say. And as the sitting council, um, do do we follow that unanimous decision? I mean, I mean, do we still have a leg to stand on, so to speak? I mean, the task force says. No, I know. Well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um. Every time this uh, re referendum has been presented to uh, 
uh, uh, different areas, BC, etc. Uh, it's been turned down. And it's probably been turned down on the basis, that's my understanding, John. It's been turned down on the basis of lack of understanding, and or too many options, or too confusion. It wasn't written very well. And I must say, I, I share your opinion. Uh, you know, I don't think we need a vo an award system, but maybe I have a very narrow viewpoint. It's Ralph's viewpoint, and, and I think that I, I serve all the members of this uh, mono equally. But um, maybe I'm missing something. Um, if we if, if we ignore the possibility that there are other voting systems, uh, then maybe we're, we're we're missing something. So I I think credit that it's a it's it's a worthwhile thing to to look at. Um, I recognize that um, you you might come up with an opinion that the council doesn't like. That's the same as all the things that, that happen here. The council makes a decision based on the advice that they get, and they, they take it or leave it. But uh, the advice would come along with some understanding and uh, research that had been done uh, on the on the uh, subjects of the, the various aspects of this. Uh, so I, that's why I support going ahead with it. Ralph, you're quite correct about the outcome in BC and Ontario. The question put to the ref by way of a referendum was about proportional representation. And the formula to get to proportional representation in both instances was so complex and so confusing, and quite frankly, I think deliberately so, uh, that it failed in both instances. Uh, municipally, on the other hand, uh, this was done, a rank ballot was done by London, Ontario, I believe successfully. Uh, and it was a referendum question for at least two other municipalities who overwhelmingly voted to support it for the next election. Uh, but I'm afraid that, uh, you know, I don't know that any of us are going to be around to see uh, see this uh, in, in eight years' time. <laughs> and so I think we need to get on with it task force to see whether it's an option and uh, uh, as, uh, as Fred says, uh, we can always say no to it. Um, you know, I, I have strong views about uh, rank ballot, uh, less strong views about the war system. <laughs> By the way, it was 7,200 electors. More or less. Dogs, cats, Okay, so um, we have the motion uh, before you regarding the we electoral process. Um, whereas Mobile Strategic Plan calls for a review of the town's electoral process in advance of the next municipal election. And whereas there's a specific timelines that need to be met if Mobile wants to change electoral process in time for the next election. And whereas options such as ranked ballot and ward system require research and consultation be it resolved that Mono establish a working group or task force to investigate possible changes to our electoral process in time to be implemented before the next municipal election. So could I have someone move that? And second, Rachel Lowe. Okay, um, any further discussion? All in favor? Three, four, and opposed? Okay, so it carries. And I guess the next uh, question is how many members need to be on this? Can, can, can I suggest that we simply advertise and, and deal with the issue of uh, number of uh, members uh, in response to what kind of reaction we get? Okay, and do we want to have a member of council also to be considered or should we leave it just to the open public. I believe it's public. Okay. So but we can have that we can revisit that discussion whenever we Okay. Okay. Pardon? Okay. They just said to wait and see who applies and then we know what we're dealing with. So we have to re advertise. Um, there has been a request that we have a recess of five, ten minutes. Is Mike around or has he disappeared? Okay. 
So item five, the planning report, um, the OPPS reviews. Mr. Trotman, you gave us lots to think about. Is there a Coles Notes version that you want to, <laughs> final statements? Um, Mayor Ryan, I would humbly reply by saying it's on page four of my report. <laughs> Thank you. I've been told to keep my comments short, so. I'm open to any questions council may have on the review of the provincial policy statement. There is a lot there. Would you like me to make a few comments first or? I mean, there's, there's an overall attempt to make it more flexible. And um, a main driver is to increase housing supply. But I think if you, you weigh through, uh, there's, there's many key themes that two of great anxiety are market demand push for housing, which could upset um, growth management targets and, um, you know, particularly in the urban areas, housing plans for mix of housing. And number two is, well, go ahead, yeah. That's, I mean, it's parts like that that I simply don't understand. So we have met our growth targets and we're fine. And you're saying if they do these changes and now it's market demand that becomes important. If a developer came along here tomorrow and said, um, oh, I want to put a subdivision in with 200 houses. And we said, well, uh, we've met our growth targets. Uh, we're going to oppose it. And well, he can turn around and say, well, look, this is market demand. This is, this is demand for housing. And we'd be overturned. Well, and more to the point of where <clears throat> say municipality is trying to provide a range of housing types, the, how, the, the market demand card could be could be played that well I, I don't want to put up uh, stack town housing or uh, fourplex or, or towns I, I, I the, my demand I've got people wanting single-family homes um, so that's what there's my market demand local municipality so there's a there's a an example uh, and particularly in view of the fact that many urban municipalities as well as some smaller towns as well are struggling with what they call the middle the missing middle which is something between what we see as high condo tower and low density, uh, you know, three-story triplexes, fourplexes, things of that nature. That's missing. And there's gonna be a greater and greater need for that. So this could upset that balance, that's true. And then, I mean, I think as uh, the letter, no, yep. You, you do it now, a developer comes to Mayor and wants to put in a development. We don't tell him or it what type of housing to put in. They come to us with a proposal so how does that change anything? Well, they always come with a proposal, but there's always a review of that proposal. I mean, it has to meet the po I mean, it has to meet the policy test of the local official plan. So, um, I mean, we're a little bit more constrained because we have hamlets and we don't have. Does our official plan specify what type of housing we can't do, will or will not allow? Well, generally, but not in, not on a secondary or, or neighborhood basis, no. There's, there, there's an encouragement for a range of housing. But so I think what I'm saying here is that the PPS, if it gets changed, could ch could force changes where uh, in areas or in other, particularly in towns and cities where municipalities have identified other types of densities of housing um, that meets their overall housing mix. This could upset it by saying, well, that's not the market demand. I need to, I need to build this. Does this mean development of more housing for Mona is more or less likely if this provincial policy statement gets changed? Just a simple yeah. question. I would say more likely for sure. If it goes through as is, yeah. <coughs> certainly for land conversions, you, there's certainly a greater encouragement for land conversions where there's non provincially significant employment areas. We don't have any. We're, we don't have a Pearson Airport Industrial Hub or 400 Hub. So those are not provincially significant. Those can be, there's a more encouragement for those to be considered for conversion. And of course, what would it likely be? Housing. And there's a whole other array of changes that come under, you know, uh, resource extraction. And I've alluded to some of them. Um, I think the letter that went to Mr. Deputy Mayor Krillman, I, I don't know if that was um, circulated to the rest of council, but there was 
yeah, okay. So there was a, that letter, I think, weighs a bit further into those particular matters. Um, extraction, mineral aggregate extraction. So there's obviously greater flexibility being proposed for that as well under that section of the provincial policy statement. Well, you, call, you, you, you call it flexibility. I call it catastrophe. In fact. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm using, yeah, I mean, I don't add value to that term. So it is flexibility, whether it's good flexibility or bad flexibility, I, I, I haven't painted it either way. But to your point, it provides greater flexibility, whether it's whether it's good or not, depending on which side of the fence yeah. or perspective you're looking at. I agree with your point. It may or may the, not be good. The, the, the notion of, of uh, mining below the water table really, really troubles me. We've had a tradition in this town of, uh, of opposing any any suggestion of, of uh, mining below the water table. I can remember an application that came in in the late '90s uh, in behind uh, Mono Plaza. And um, uh, my, uh, my, I called it the sub pump subdivision. Uh, it was going to end up being a, a subdivision after it had been mined out, but they were proposing to go below the water table. So I, I dubbed it the sub pump subdivision because, quite frankly, that's what they would be dealing with uh, in that in that scenario. Now, fortunately, that application was withdrawn. Uh, I am very concerned about the uh, uh, the aggregate matter. I'm curious, however, uh, about the reference to tiny, tiny homes, tiny houses, and whether we, we currently have a, a minimum size uh, for uh, uh, a house in, in Mono, and uh, I, I think that maybe that's something that we should review at some point. Uh, but do you see the province saying, uh, you know, it, it's discriminatory to have a, uh, a, a minimum size footprint? Do you think it's discriminatory to have a minimum size? I think it depends where you are. In Toronto, maybe. Here, I don't think so. Can, can you just clarify for us? I had understood on the below the water table issue that that had already been tested. I, I know the Craig Pitt rivers called in its original license. They had to stay whatever what, a meter, meter and a half above the water table. But when they, uh, the big cement company Pitt owned it, uh, yeah, St. Mary's made its application to change the license. I, I had thought, Mark, that we it had already been determined because there's been a court challenge. Municipalities cannot vertically zone, and they applied to go below the water table. Now that application didn't succeed, but it was not because the municipality had any zoning control over that. It was simply because the CBC or the hydrogeology report basically said, "Hey, you've got major problems. Can, can we zone?" vertically right now? No, in the Mono case, actually, the, the, the ministry in Peterborough stepped forward and, and basically said no to, to that particular application, to the request to go under the water table in Mono. They, they, they hadn't provided enough information. We did say, we did say no. No, there, there was an open case, I believe it was in Puss Lunch, uh, on, on the same matter. So we were quite surprised when the ministry actually stepped forward at the time and released a formal decision stating that they will not be allowed to go below the water table on that particular pit. But they did issue that letter. Yeah, that's what it's all about. You know, com I think there were comments submitted by OSSGA, the Ontario Sand and Gravel Association this and also the plan I could use. So I mean their commentary back to the province was you need to simplify the PPS and make things that are truly provincially significant only be contained in that document. And one of the comments they made was there's far too, I'm just reciting some of what they said. They in their opinion there's uh, far too much overlap of policy and also um, that there are uh, there's there's uh, natural heritage features and lands that are not provincially significant by definition that should be should be made available where there is aggregate resource to be extracted. That's one of their themes in their letter.
So, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. On page four, you've listed a summary, um, uh, Mr. Trotman, of six items, um, which are suggestions. Uh, uh, I say, I'm going to read this. The following comments are suggested on behalf of the town of Mono. So we really haven't dealt, I don't think, with the uh, water table, below the water table extraction issue in a very straightforward manner. We do come right out and, and say what we think about that. Um, I think the, uh, this is an important matter, and um, this is uh, the way I read it, if I understand the, uh, the proposal, is that it allows, um, it prevents us from commenting on this even, let alone uh, uh, passing a, by a preventive bylaw. Um, once the original, um, uh, once, once the original uh, uh, approval has been made for the uh, aggregate extraction, so they can they can uh, uh, propose an aggregate extraction that's above the water table, and then later on apply to go below the water table, and we don't have much opportunity to uh, to deal with it. So uh, I think we should be saying something uh, in, in in this uh, recommendation, which. Uh, 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 applies to that specific problem. We can have that in. That's a reference to the changes proposed under uh, 2525. Yeah. So, uh, but specifically, stronger language in terms of very direct. Would Council of Town of Mono object strongly to below the water table extraction now or in the future? And we should be able to maintain the ability to object as they're perfect because they, they, mm -hmm. they're just sort of trying to smooth over it and that's the way we feel as a council we should have the right to be able to object and uh, take it to whatever tribunal to try and uh, stop something that we know that is incorrect for our municipality yeah, I'm going to add that into our comment. It's actually two, 2524, sorry, I got the wrong section. But it is new language proposed in the PPS under that subsection. So um, right now, if it used to be that if uh, an opponent had a license and they wanted to go below the water table, they had to apply for a new license. Uh, no, no, there's no such thing as a renewal on a gravel pit license. Right there, they don't have a sunset on the end. They go forever, or until basically until the proponent releases the license, they give it up. Um, it used to be that way. Then they made a change, and they changed it so that they they have they uh, instituted this two-tiered amendment uh, system. So they have major site amendments and minor site amendments. Minor site amendments, MNRF just passes them. You guys probably don't even hear them. I'm guessing for the minors. Immediate neighbors. Is that right? Even they do? I'm not even sure they do for minor ones. Well, no, because depending if it affects a neighbor, uh, like oh, a setback sure. issue, if they get the immediate neighbor's permission, they just go ahead and okay. don't don't even let us know. Right. Uh, now, what they said was to they they instituted a policy where they could convert a license from above the water table to below the water table, and they consider that a major site amendment. So they circulate it. You guys would be circulated on. So you would have the opportunity to comment. That that doesn't disappear. Um, but if they institute the PPS change and take away your ability to do the vertical zoning, then you don't have a gate anymore. You're now you can comment on a major site amendment. It would be circulated. You can put your comments into the ministry because okay. So right now because there has never been a court decision on the vertical zone. There's been ones that have been scheduled to go to court. It has never actually gone through court and been decided. 
So what the ministry is essentially doing is saying, we're not waiting for the court. We're just going to tell you this is the way it's going to be. Okay? <clears throat> That's right. Now, um, at the same time, they have um, just published in the last week or so um, some rough uh, ideas of what they would like to change in the Aggregate Resource Act. And these two things obviously work together. So, um, but what they didn't do, and what they have no intention of doing, according to the case officer in Peterborough, is actually releasing the changes they want to do. So they, so they have produced sort of a one pager that goes, well, we, we want to do this, but they haven't released the legislation, so we don't know exactly what they want to do. So in there, they do say that they want to strengthen protection for water and that they would um, put in something that would allow municipalities and others, is the wording, um, to uh, object to an LPAT hearing. So you would have, that's, that's something that's uh, newer than the PPS pieces. Um, but of course what that does, if, if you have vertical zoning, then the proponent has to pay for the changes, right? because it's, a new, it's essentially a, an application for a zoning. So you guys can build them for your, your analysis. What they're doing is flipping it around so that now you have to object and therefore you have to foot the whole bill for your objection and all the analysis and everything else. So what they've done is they've taken the burden off the industry and put it onto the municipalities. In the okay. license amendment process. In the in the site amendment process. The site site amendment plan process. amendments. Major site plan amendments. Now, in the planning process with the PPS in place, what that would mean is what we what we were able to do with the the Craig Pit was to have a an applicant voluntarily um, put in the zoning bylaw the vertical zoning. I mean that was the key there was. Uh, Moyers agreed to, to the clause going into to the um, site plan. Why would any aggregate operator limit themselves now with, with that being in place in the PPS? And even if they do, their, the wording in the PPS, they have released that wording. It, it is quite specific and says conflict. that no, under if there's any conflict in terms of depth of extraction, the ARA rules. Planning Act, forget it. The Greenwood application is in, and they've, in their application, have kept well above the water table, right? And and that is proceeding. But if they know these changes are coming, well, I mean, I guess I guess I don't even know how to ask this question. Why would they stick to that, whatever it was, five meters above the water table? Let's phrase it a little differently, Fred. But just so we don't make Mr. Greenwood out to be the devil here. Um, so he has said he's going to stay. I think it's four or five meters above. Okay, and that's great. Life of this pit will be 25, 50, 100 years. Who knows, right? Because there, there is no end to the licenses. So will he be the one that's running the company when they get down to that level? So it's, it's, not, it's not, and again, my comments were, I mean, obviously they're spurred by the fact that we're battling that particular application, but it's not just about that, it's about it in general. So, Pete, it, it show, is. Show, show something and then take it away. And so, I was going to suggest that we, we tailor David's comments on the PPS to also go to the ARA comments at the same time uh, through council just to save us this, this is a good discussion and save us from coming back again. Yeah. Because yeah. 21st, it has to. Well, I'm saying we'll get it done like this week. Oh, okay. Because, and that, as I say, I think we, we need to keep at some points as simplistic and direct as possible, as opposed to great planning language, but. There, there's a variety of changes, and I, and I understand what you're saying, Mayor Lord, Mayor Ryan, where we, we may just want to choose a few of the key ones. That one you mentioned being one of them. So in other words, from my
my perspective, everything you've done so far is fine. And if you could spruce it up, that would be great. And any other additions or concerns that we want highlighted? I, I, I will tell council we will also have information in there about their haul route. It's very, very vague. Uh, that they say that the LPAT will no longer place conditions on haul routes and I don't know what that means because I would kind of turn it the other way if and if that was the case if they're going to leave it to municipalities to decide who's going to have an access point to their roadway and if the municipality is going to say no I don't know what LPAT's going to do with, with, with the decision if they can't tell a municipality that they have to enter so it's very great, and it's the same thing. They've just thrown out their wish list, but they haven't said where they're going with it. So that would be another point yeah. that I've seen in the area stuff that we'll be hammering down. Okay. So uh, we do have a motion that council receive the provincial policy statement report by the director of planning dated October 1st, 2019, and that the report to form the basis of comments submitted by the town to the province. So that leaves it wide open for mm -hmm anything else so got moved by Martin and seconded by Mankelo any further discussion all in favor that carries okay uh, item six the CDRC board motion regarding the application for replacement of the CDRC arena roof mm -hmm. and so we have a motion that council supports the CDRC Complex Board of Manager Resolution for the Town of Shelburne to spend an application and investment in Canada infrastructure program for the replacement of the CDRC arena roof. Moved by Nix and seconded by Martin. And uh, this has to go in the form of a letter of support. All in favor? Carried. And uh, now we're on to Schedule A. So, Sharon, did you have any you wanted to start with? You do. Can you uh, put your mic on? Okay, well then we'll come back to you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, I just want to report actually letter from Sylvia Grangenger expressing uh, thanks for the motor delegation. I actually went to see Sylvia Arena uh, in my personal capacity uh, to uh, raise a number of, of issues that I thought might come up in that area for community safety task force. I didn't at any time suggest that I was there on behalf of, uh, of council. such as uh, photo radar yeah. um, and um, uh, increasing uh, uh, set lines and so forth. That's fine. That's good that you did that. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I just worry that people could think that, that yeah. you know, I was there to speak on behalf of council, which I certainly was not. I, I, in fact, suggested that if I could grab a few minutes of your time in the hallway, I could go attend to that, and the next thing I know, Whoever else is in the room. Did you have any others? Uh, no, I'm fine. Okay. Sharon, are you up and running again? No. No, I'm good. Okay. Um, Fred? Uh, nothing really, except I would say I was really impressed. Impressed is probably not the right word with that letter from Springwater on the joint and several liability issue. I mean, it's. And we've written them into there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I just, boy, that, that stuff is scary. Well, just a comment about the NVCA uh, budget. It's uh, the uh, budget increase is uh, three point uh, was it three point seven six percent, which I think was twice that last year. Anyway, <laughs> one's memory dies. <laughs> anyway, we had a very interesting budget meeting. <laughs> the uh, uh, there was a move to. Uh, 
Well, you know, the Minister Yurik has suggested that we should not increase our fees, period. And so there was a thought among uh, some of the uh, members of the board that we should probably not um, raise this hackles by doing so. And uh, we should try and keep to a zero increase. And uh, so the entire discussion was uh, about that. It was uh, slightly, uh, it, was, it was passed with a 3% increase, but it was not much of a majority. Interesting, we didn't discuss a single item in the budget. Not a single item. Like we tear ours apart, and we, you know, we ask um, Mike Dunmore to, you know, pony up with why why all this stuff. But we didn't ask anybody anything. And I, so I, I talked to uh, one of the um, the office staff afterwards and says, "Is this the norm?" And they said, "No." And then when Fred next was there, <laughs> but uh, so anyway, this amounts to ninety-five thousand for Town of Mono, and that's a. Uh, as a, an increase of somewhere like around one and a half thousand. I've lost the number. Yeah. Okay, so if there's nothing for, uh, uh, further that we accept Schedule A to this agenda, it's moved by Mix and seconded by Drummond. All in favor? Curious? Okay, so reports of staff. Les, do you have anything? Mike, do you have anything? Many things, but I had nothing really substantive to this okay. point. Nothing. Fred, you're back in town, but I know what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So exactly. So hence, no report. <laughs> no report. <laughs> Excellent. You fly there, you yeah. gamble when you're there. You're not Let me re anything. reiterate: no report. <laughs> <laughs> he still got a shirt. He still does have a shirt. It looks like a new tie. <laughs> I have four items, they're all very quick. Uh, um, the county is looking for a representative of council for the county service review steering committee. Okay. So, you can put your mind to that. Sonia anybody, is. Anybody? John's interested. Anybody else interested? Uh, they're just looking for one from each municipality. Okay. Okay, I will pass that on. Uh, the Shelburne Fire Agreement, so this is for Fred and I guess Sharon. I don't know if you've heard what happened last night. So after uh, Shelburne asking for the agreement to be redrafted and the CAOs and the treasurer sit down and go through it, and we did, and we've got it all signed, Shelburne Council last night balked at approving the amendment, and they want it brought back. They don't like the fact that they're 52% and only have you know, less than a majority of the vote. So. It's I, Rosemont I, I, fire I all over again. They don't want what? They, my understanding, we didn't get a lot of information, but they, they've been directed to send their councillors back to the fire board to rediscuss the changes to the agreement. I suspect it's regarding the fact that they've now gone to 52% of the uh, population. So anyway, so not approved and it's coming back. Um, fire marquee, sorry, I didn't get anything to you. I was waiting for information from Chris. I got that uh, Sunday night. Um, I'm trying to rationalize his numbers with our other numbers, but I'll get something back to you uh, for next council meeting. And Les will have to carry that for me because I just to let you know I will be away next council meeting. So. Thanks. Well, did you have any report? I have a few things, uh, Your Honor. Um, I met with Jake today and I did a two step uh, password authentication, which I think is a really good idea. I met our CIO on the way out and he mentioned that he had done the same thing. Um, so this is a great way to um, prevent yourself from being hacked. Um, the uh, health board, a number of things are happening. Um, I, we had an in-camera session, and I can't really tell you uh, too much, but I can tell you that um, there's um, ongoing uh, talks about um, uh, alternatives to the uh, merger uh, that's been proposed, and uh, there is a person um, which the Ministry of Health is assigning to work between the ministry and each uh, health board. And that person is supposed to act as a um, mediator and a go-between, and that, that hasn't, hasn't happened yet. 
that uh, Dr. Mercer has met with the uh, Minister of Health and they've had a fulsome discussion, that's about all I can say. There are quite a few things that are on the last health board thing which were of interest to you and I'll be very brief about them, but one was uh, well water testing. You know those little bottles that you have that you can send away? And uh, there are 31,000 wells in the um, Wellington, Guelph, uh, Dufferin uh, Health Board area. Um, of these, um, it's recommended that they all send in a bottle once a year to be tested, some more than that. The uh, provincial average for testing is about 25% of those households. Um, our testing is 10%. Now, it, 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 and of that 10, of, of the, well, those that were tested, um, I think it was 21% had significant bacteria in them. So there's a problem, and um, they don't really have a they don't really have a plan for upping the numbers. So um, I'll just leave that with you. Vaping is an interesting thing, which uh, the health board has really taken an interest in. As you probably know, there are about 800 cases in North North America, mostly in the states, which have had uh, vaping-related respiratory illnesses. Most of them being admitted to hospital, some being put on respirators, etc. Um, 13 deaths, the last count. Uh, nobody quite knows what's going on. Um, it doesn't seem to fit with any particular device or any particular substance that's being vaped, although the main substances are THC, the psychotropic uh, factor in cannabis, uh, and nicotine, or combinations of the two. It's interesting that with um, vaping now, you can get a nicotine load that's way above what you could get out of a cigarette. So apparently one, I don't know these little devices, but one filling of that can be equal to a pack of cigarettes. So it could be pretty heavy on the, on the nicotine. So there's significant concern about where we go with this. It's the one thing that President Trump has done that I agree with. Um, I'd like to tell you about deaths. Deaths. D-E-A-T-H. That's deaths. deaths that are attributable to substance abuse. Last year there were 4,500 deaths that were attributable to uh, opioid overdose in Canada. Uh, and uh, five years ago it was half that. So it's going up and up and so nobody really wants to take it. Yeah, well, it's interesting it didn't because of all the substance abuses, it's third. The second most common is alcohol, which is 15,000 deaths. And the most common is smoking, smoking which uh, is a crime, uh, is a crime for 48,000 deaths per year in, in Canada. So, but uh, I had a phone call today uh, from a uh, woman who works as the um, um, land manager for Lafarge. I don't know whether you've heard of this not yet uh, on the mark. Um, there is a pit on the sixth uh, line on the west side, just south of the airport road, which is an old uh, Lafarge pit. She said it hasn't been used or worked or anything done for about 20 years, and that they're going to do some rehabilitation to it. And she was calling me to let me know that there'd be dump trucks passing by and that residents might be concerned, um, such as uh, a friend of a back, and what are these dump trucks doing? So she said that they're rehabilitating the, the I think, the back slope, which for some reason, uh, after 20 years of doing nothing, needs re re rehabilitation. And uh, I'm a bit, of, a bit pessimistic with this, but anyway, uh, that's what's going to be happening. I don't know any more information about it than that. It's going to go on for about two or three weeks with uh, dump trucks coming in with fill. She claimed she didn't know where the fill came from, but it wasn't from Toronto, but it was going to be clean fill. So, did she give any indication why she called you as a councillor as opposed to I staff? was first on her list. I think that she was going to call uh, councillor uh, Nix and Martin next, and uh, um, or that she called me at six six o'clock. You guys were at lunch, I think. That's right. Yeah. Well, if she's called me, I'll make sure I tell her that the the chain of command is if something like this happens, it goes directly to the CAO. Well, I suggested to her that she should put this in a um, uh, letter form. In a letter form, and she said, "Oh, I don't do enough for that." So, oh. 
Well, I, I don't know quite what's going on there. She didn't want a, a trail, paper trail, or she bought an email trail. Mm. And, uh, have you heard what's going on? stay on the right side of the fuel bottle. Oh. So they can bring anything in. Okay, so who's testing what they bring in? Hmm. Okay. Okay, it's red. The Head Headwater Streams Committee had a tree planting session on Saturday with seven to, uh, TD Canada Trust grant to the NBCA to get 75 people out. I'd really like to thank our mayor who, who provided food for 75 people and Sharon who came along to coordinate all that because Laura was busy. And I'd like to, of course, thank Ralph for showing me how to turn on a tap. And, we, and give you our water. <laughs> And point out that you pay for that water. Um, the 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 fight for Fragmites still goes on. Um, I in fact I spent this morning cutting Fragmites, which is why I'm so tired. But the the Headwater Streams Committee will be coming to the council with a report on the four sites and the four different methods we use. There's going to be some, I think, maybe not so good news here because we failed in some areas. But that that's that's. That's the nature of the thing. I've also had a discussion with, with Mike, and I mean, this is just a thought. Um, I think Mike is be prepared in our budget for 2020 is probably gonna have a, uh, a line, may have a line item, okay? I don't wanna put words in your mouth, Mike, but we've talked about this because I think the town is gonna have to get involved in, in trying to control Fred Um I guess the, the last, the last- He doesn't remember that conversation. Yes, you do. <laughs> oh, I remember, but the 500 emails I've received in the last couple of days from Frag the Bag it has went bag the frag. Frag the bag <laughs> is now a Facebook, and they're generating. I know generating volunteers, and it's Amaranth, Malmer, Mono, and Melanchthon Large now. Um, and I think they made a presentation to Orangeville. And, and I we, maybe we don't need any money if it gets really big. No, okay, I I attended that meeting. I met these people. Uh, the main guy is from Momer, Ernie. I forget his last name, but they're very enthusiastic. Um, I'll, there are more on this later. Okay, uh, and, and and Mike is in the email chain. I I, I my personal view is. It's good to have them. They're going to raise public awareness. They're going to maybe teach some landowners about Fragmites. But I still think they're not going to solve the town's problem with 62 significant Fragmites sites on, on, on our road sites. Uh, the last point I would make is that I sent you all an email. And if it doesn't cost too much, I know staff is waiting for direction. Could we put something? Could if I get some copy to you on our website about being careful about birds during migration season and windows and cats, it, it, I did, surely it wouldn't cost anything to put that someplace on our website. Mark? <laughs> He's the wrong person to ask. It's probably Fred because Mark's already given you his opinion. Circle of life, Fred. <laughs> I, it doesn't cost anything to put something on. If you can get us something, that's fine. But I just. Yes. Just a quick question on Fred's comment. Are they using plastic bags for the frags? trying to 
think that uh, anything of noteworthy, it's all either the arena or the Rosemont Fire Board. We've got county council on Tuesday night, uh, Thursday night this week, but uh, my committee didn't meet because we had no uh, quorum. And I'm sure you heard about the uh, planning issue in uh, Amaranth, so you know what we're, we're doing with that. And uh, other than that, um, hope everybody has a good long weekend. Um, I think I, Mike. I think I've told council about the report going to county council on Thursday with regard to um, locally administered provincial offenses, and our consultant is recommending that we remain. With Calvin, with some significant changes to the um, memorandum of understanding, and uh, potentially the uh, uh, board of management. Um, also, he's made recommendations with regard to how we can step up our game in terms of uh, collection of, uh, of, um, of outstanding fines, which in the county of Dufferin currently stands at some three million dollars. So I think I did touch on that in the last meeting. Uh, I just wanted to, to, to bring up the issue of our ongoing uh, issue with YouTube. Uh, I have written to both a reporter at the Toronto Star and Go Public at the CBC to try and get them interested in this little story of uh, uh, David uh, versus Goliath. Um, I haven't heard back from, uh, from either one yet, but I'm, uh, I live in hope. One thing I think council should be aware of, uh, which I think is somewhat significant and really alarming, is that the message that, that YouTube has put up that anyone trying to find our channel will encounter reads as follows. This account has been terminated due to multiple or severe violations of YouTube's policy against spam, deceptive practices, and misleading content or other terms of service violations. There's nothing in there to suggest that we are alleged to have. There's nothing in there to say that we are under investigation. It is a bald statement to the effect that we just did it. And I think it is bordering on the actionable to suggest what they are putting out there for the world to see. Um, you know, this count has been terminated due to multiple or severe violations, period. And that's what the public sees when they try and, and find uh, our council meetings online. <laughs> well, nothing quite as dramatic as that. Um, uh, I think that a lot of people know that there was a climate uh, rally in Orangeville and it was um, quite remarkable to see the number of people who were there and uh, I have to say that the teenagers who came from the high school and they walked the gauntlet on the sidewalk before we headed out onto the road uh, they were quite shocked to see all these old people <laughs> there too they think they think it just belongs to them that was that was really good and uh, and uh, I think it was um, it got a lot of attention. Um, what else? Yes, our our tree planting day. I didn't plant one tree, but that was okay because Fred was busy doing that. So that that was really good. And um, it was. I met a lot of people that day that I've never seen before, and three people from our local TD Bank, which was we haven't had local TD Bank people for a while. And uh, the, I think that's about it. Oh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention was the uh, Dufferin Foundation. What's the whole word? The Community, community Foundation. foundation um, had an event last, um, September last Sunday, and it was a fabulous event. And um, they gave out uh, some mini grants 
to a number of people, and I, it was quite well attended and a very uh, a good afternoon. Very nice to see people being happy walking away with their checks. That's it. Okay, so we have uh, any notices of motion? Then there's no in cameras, so now we are going to close off unless there is any other comments mentioned. Happy Thanksgiving. That's right. That we introduce and give the necessary readings to a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of Council of the Town of Mulvado in session 19, 2019, held on 8 October 2019, that be signed by the Mayor and the Clerk and sealed in the Gross and Bylaw Book. Moved by Martin and seconded by Creelman. All in favor? And that we adjourn at 9 34 p.m. And that's moved by Nix and seconded by Manctolo. All in favor? Thanks very much, everybody.